budget and bow your heads for a minute. Loving Heavenly Father, we come for you to hear what you had, message you have had prepared for us for today. Please purge my tongue, my mind, my words. May they not be my own. May my frail humanity, my undeserving tongue, be blessed by the Holy Spirit. Empty myself of me. Bless every ear hearing the word today, that they hear your words and not mine. Thank you, Lord, for being with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 How many people are ready to go home now? <laughs> uh, money. I, I'm, I'm going to struggle with the message today because there is so much, so much on money. And I've had to just kind of skip over the top and pick up a few things, a few points for us today. It's, it's very interesting that... It's not a well-talked-about subject in church. People tend to feel that that's private business. Um, that's between me and God. Don't ask me about my money. I'm doing what I need to do. Uh, don't judge me. Um, and if I were to try and question you, you would feel no different than if I were asking you to take your clothes off in public. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. <laughs> it's personal. And I think because it, um, it upsets people, it's better not to talk about it. And I think that uh, the only reason why we think it's better not to talk about it is because we don't want to be the one that people are going to see me coming and they're going to say, oh, there she comes. She might see I've got a new pair of shoes on. She might say, oh, she might see how much shopping I've got in my trolley. And then, so no one wants to be that person. But it doesn't have to be personal. The principles of, of, of very common. There's a lot that every one of us, in fact, if you ever get an e e economic um, workshop to attend that talks about money, the character money, the nature money, and how it works, I recommend you go because there is so much that we could benefit by learning. We, we, we have to be knowledgeable and educated in the way of, of, of our environment, the world that we live in, because we don't want to be ignorant fools. God's people should never be ignorant fools. Um, I found this very interesting uh, quote, you know, I, I like to do this and then compare it with everything else that I found. Um, asking Google, um, what does the Bible say about money? It's interesting. The short answer. Why does the Bible mention money so often? It often surprises Christians when they just discover just how much the Bible talks about money. In fact, there are more than 2,300 verses on money, wealth, and possessions. Jesus spoke about money roughly 15% of his preaching. And 11 out of 39 parables were on money. 
Did you realize that? It was an important issue to Jesus. And that that's just Jesus' ministry. If you go into Old Testament and you start looking at the instructions that God gave to the Israelites about money, you'll find it's it's an equal proportion to every other teaching that we hold to. <coughs> we talk about diet, and we're not ashamed to say, oh, don't take too much sugar, don't eat processed foods, don't, because we believe it. We know it's true. And so we'll stand on it and we'll be proud and we'll say, these things are good for you. These things are healthy. And we also say, if you break these rules, you're going to get sick. Is, is that okay? Is it okay to say that? Well, what about the rules on money? Is it good to also stand here and say, these are the rules on money. And if you break these rules, you're going to have consequences. You'll either be poor, or you will be uh, separated from the love of God, or you will have um, some other tragedy. I mean, the, the, the one story about the man who had such a bumper crop and he thought, wow, I haven't got enough bonds. So he took all the profits from that crop and built himself a whole lot of other bonds to fill those bonds with, with the next year's crop and then he died. What did he benefit? What did he benefit? Jesus wanted us to listen to all of these parables, these stories, and actually focus as much on them as we do on our salvation or our health or our, our family relations is just as, as important. And then by, um, by studying these things and becoming educated about them, we can become wise as to why God's principles are so important. Um, a lot of people will hear things about money and they think, oh, now I want to give my life to Christ. I, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be uh, responsible for money being my God, so I'm going to lay it down. I will never have things because those things will cause me uh, to lose my relationship with God. And, and that, that doesn't come from a Bible. That, you must always remember, wherever there's a truth, there is a deception. And, and you've always got to test everything unto the law and unto the testimony and see if that is what God wants you to do. Um, I just want to look at whether God thinks we should have money. And here's a few things. It's our duty with money. Genesis 3, verse 17 is the first time God talks about, it's not money per se, but it's about economy. And it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat, cursed is the ground for thy sake. <coughs> <coughs> in sorrow shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, and out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So he's saying, it's not going to be easy now to live. Before the fall, food was everywhere. You were hungry, you ate. Now the ground is cursed. You're going to sweat. It's not if you want money, go and sweat. No. You will sweat. By the sweat of your brow will you eat. So if you haven't sweated by your brow, don't expect to eat. Does that make sense? So we must work. We have to work. Then we've got in Proverbs where it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider thy ways, and be wise. Why do we go to the ant? Because the ant never stops working. He, you can watch him all day, and he's carrying loads ten times bigger than himself, coming back for another bread crumb, and off he goes. And he will be doing that all day. He's never weary of work. 
1 uh, Timothy 5 verse 8. I'm just picking out a, diff, a, a few examples. 1 Timothy um, 5 verse 8. But if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That is, that is <laughs> strong talk. If you're not providing for your family, if you're not, and it's talking about the first one, especially, uh, it, it says, did not provide for his own, that's one, and then, and especially his own house. So it's his family, and then not only those in his household, but the extended community, the extended family. Every man is, has that placed on his shoulders. That if he's someone in his environment who is suffering and struggling, and you're not helping, you are worse than an infidel. Strong words. Do you need money to do that? You have to have money to do that. How are you going to help and provide for your family, for your community, if you haven't got the money? You have to have money. So you have to work. You have to have money. Then we go on to Haggai. Haggai 1 verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. <coughs> ye have so much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but yet have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe, ye clothe you, but there is none more. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put in, it into, bag, into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, it did blow up. I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stained from dew. And the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and, men, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labour of, the, of, the, of thy hands. Um, basically, he's saying, you want to live in sealed up houses where my house isn't sealed up so he's expecting you to also take care of his house it's our duty to provide the house of worship for the Lord and we cannot expect the blessing that we seek if his house is not secured I, I'm going to leave you to go and read the book of Haggai for yourself and ask the Lord to speak to you when you're reading it to tell you what it is he's saying there. Then we've got in Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. We also find in, in Malachi where he talks about, and in, 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 you ask me, how do I rob you? And, and, and I tell you, in tithes and offerings, because it is his. A tenth of your income is his. If you don't pay it, 
you have essentially robbed him because it was never yours. It is his. So a lot of people are happy, they understand about the tithe, and they're sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, woman, I know, I pay my tithe, and I don't have to tell you how much it is, and I don't have to, I pay my tithe, and I am right with God. <coughs> is that all he asked for? He, that's just not what he asked for, that's what he owns. He owns that. Then he asks for more. Now, we look at it, I just, I can't get enough verses packed into the time that we have. So I'm going to rush through a few and you can go and search them out for yourself. Summary. Our duty with money. The tithe. Provide for our families. To care for the house of the Lord. To care for the poor. Feed the hungry and clothe the naked. Your first fruits offerings. Your thank offerings your free will offerings, your funding the preaching of the gospel in all the world, and to owe no man anything. You just say to yourself, I can't do this. I, I wouldn't have any money left for me. That is the test. Your concern is me. Where is obedience? Where does it come to the place where, it, where the little boy can give his lunch, all of it, for Jesus? And how did Jesus prove himself to the faithfulness of the little boy? He uses it to feed a multitude. That's his faith. Faith that I will obey with all that I have and I will trust that whatever the consequence is in God's hands and know that he will not put you in a situation that you are not able to bear. Now, having said this, I want to talk about money itself. And some of these principles. We've I've been, been in business, my husband and I, since we got married 37, 38 years ago. And I learned something from him because he's quite a bit older than me, he'd been in business by him, for himself many years before me. And I used to start getting tight with the money when the money was getting low in the bank. And so I would say to him, or um, please don't write any checks. It's coming up to end month. I haven't got enough to meet the wages. And every time I said, please don't spend any money, he would just ignore me, go straight out the door with the checkbook and go and blow 20,000, 30,000. And I would be in tears and I'd say, I can't pay the wages. And he said to me, they're not due till Friday. I say, yep, but there's no money. And you know, his principle was this. If you want money, throw money at money. And money begets money. You'll find the same principle exists in governments. When the country is going into a depression, one of the first things they do is they try and float money into the community so that there's more spending, there's more money circulating, and as soon as it starts circulating, the, the whole economy picks up. Now, I don't understand this, but I've seen the principle work. I have come to Friday and felt foolish because that injection of money, 10 days a week before wages day, boosted the income into the bank, and now suddenly I've got enough for everything. That's why I say, if you ever get the opportunity to go into an economics workshop or, or whatever, you need to, to really embrace it and go and find out about this character of money. And then apply it to God's principles. Because God says, here you go. You, yeah, you work for that money. It's your money. You can have it. And he waits because he's already told you the principle of money. Feed the poor. 
fix my house, do this, do that, do that. And if you see money as a, 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 an opportunity to be obedient to God, you are throwing money to where the blessings come from. And when you throw money to where the blessings come from, the blessings can now start to flow. And it is, it's like the most incredible thing happens when money is put where God said it must be put, is that it's somehow, and I've just heard so many stories, I could, if I could start now, I'd be still telling you tonight, but, but we people have gone on an evangelistic program, and they only had a certain amount of money, and suddenly the, 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 the rules and regulations changed, and they had to hire a hall that they didn't have to hire before, they didn't have the budget, and, and they prayed about it, and um, every day when they went to get money, there was just more money in the post. And they kept saying, where's the money coming from? And they were like, but we used 200 yesterday, it should be 200 less today, but there's no, no 200 less. You explain it, you can't explain it. God has a way of stretching money. Mm -hmm. uh, a pastor was talking on a sermon this week that just inspired me. Him and his wife have a principle of all the things that they need to pay before there's money for them. And when they were doing their year in taxes, <coughs> they started adding up their receipts. And they were adding and adding and adding. And when they got to putting expenditure versus income, their expenditure was nearly 30% greater than their income. And they said, but that's not possible. Did you put any extra money in? No. Did, well, did anybody give us any money? No. And they had to scratch their heads and think again, well, how did we spend that much if we only earned that much? But they were faithfully paying all the things first that had to be paid in their conscience. Not because <coughs> somebody in the church had a checklist and said, have you paid this, have you paid that, have you paid that? No. Between them and God, God will reveal to you what you are ready to accept. And when you're ready to accept that, he will give you something else. And there will always be something else that he wants from you about your money. And when you can enter into a relationship with him, that you can be asking him, what do you want next with my money? Actually, I said that wrong. What should we do next with your money? Is the question we should be asking God. And he will tell you. Now, this sounds very, very extreme. But if you look at the early church, they were expecting Jesus to come very soon, like in a year, two years, three years, I don't know. But he was, he'd gone to the Father to build a house and he was coming back in their lifetime. They definitely believed that. So if they believed that, then... There's no point in owning your, ha your house, your car, whatever. You just give it into the pool of the church. Let's get the gospel. Let's spread it. And you know, if they hadn't done that, the gospel would not have gone out the way that it did. And we would not be sitting here today. They, they were faithful. 100% faithful. Now I challenge you. Do we believe Jesus is going to come in our lifetime? Do we have a work to finish? Should we seriously be worrying about which car, which model, how much to pay on a mortgage, how much we should be paying in our tithe, or we can't afford free gift offerings, or thank offerings, or um, birthday offerings, or any of these other offerings? First fruits. Has anyone paid a first fruits offering before? It, it, it doesn't really have a, an opening for today, but you need to create one with your Lord because he said he wanted one. You know, it used to be when the first apple ripened on the tree, that was God's apple. When the first lamb had a baby lamb, that was God's lamb. He wants something that's a first for you. And he wants that to be his. It's a way of conditioning your mind to recognize the fact that he owes your money anyway. And unless you do it in whatever form that he asks you for it, you won't ever get to the place where you completely understand that it's his money anyway. 
Um, there's just a few interesting things about money and people that psychology has worked out. And they've studied various people for their motivation. Why, why do they need money? Why do they have to have money more than uh, just to pay your rent uh, and, and some food to eat? And, and they found that there's, there is a driving force behind everybody. And it can be that you, 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 you want it for security. You need to feel, before you can sleep at night, you know, I've got money in the bank. If I have any emergency, any problem, I've got money in the bank, and I'm safe. I'm now safe, I can go to bed. So it's a security issue. And then you have a power issue. Usually, uh, somebody who's been bullied and um, treated badly or very poor and insulted and neglected as a child, they need that money for power to say, well, I've got money. You can say what you want. I've got money. And I can go where you can't go. And I can buy things you can't buy. And it's power. It's, it gives you that sense of, 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 of per identity, right. purpose, right. value. Mm. Yeah, that no one else is willing to give to you. Money gives it to you. So it's that power surge that you get from it. And then, you, and then pleasure. Some people are born to pleasure. If they're not having fun, if they're not being entertained, if they're not feeling like spoiled, having a nice big piece of chocolate cake and a cup of coffee, spoiling themselves, they're not happy because they're not important. That extra little something just makes them feel important. Well, I ask you to go home and think about these things and ask yourself, is, are you not so important to God that he would give his only son to die for you? Are you not so dependent that, and I ask you, if, if, if your brother has been terribly ill, for example, we can't fix it, so we what? We go away. To God, please Lord, can you heal him? Why is God so important when we need him to heal somebody who's sick. We know we can't do it, but God can. Well, the same principle when it comes to money. We have to recognize before we ask God for the money help that he owns it anyway. And if we've given it when we didn't have it, we'll be able to get the blessing because money begets money. You give it, it comes back. You give it, it comes back. It's a relationship. Not just between us and God, but between money and money. Yes. I think um, love can TLC to everyone, and that, and um, certainly help neighbour or friend, sorry, or family member or friend of his, and medically how we eat and drink and all sorts does help. Yes. And it does work. Yes. Sure, it does. It does. Um, the, the difference is that God can fill us up in a way that no food can. And then lastly, I wanted to try and look at the, the relationship of money with our faith. I know it might, be, it might seem really strange that this whole topic of money is... is connected to the scripture reading which we had about the young boy that had the deaf and dumb spirit. But there is a fantastic connection. And that is that uh, we, that father of that boy had to reach a point where he could cry out from the agony in the depths of his soul. And he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. We need to want this financial security from God so bad that we can cry out to him and say, Lord, I believe. 
help them man and belief. It's private. It's between you and him. But I promise you, there is no surer rock to stand on than Jesus. And the, the, the word, he is the word. He is in the Bible. Every living word in the Bible is Jesus alive. Talk to him. Let him guide you through all your financial decisions. Trust him. Be obedient as soon as he speaks to your heart and says, I want a thank offering of the first salary of each year. I don't know. Whatever it is, when he talks to your heart, do it. I'm obedient. I will do it, Lord. I trust you. And see if he will not open the windows of heaven and bless you more than you will ever, ever imagine. Um, in closing, our human needs come from early childhood. Security, power, pleasure, and independence are all old self which are, we are to die to. Jesus comes, becomes our everything. In our faithfulness to him, he fulfills more than we can ever fulfill for ourselves. Trust him. Cry out today, Lord, I believe. Help thy mine unbelief.